Hello. My name is Ranjan Ray, and this is a joint paper with Parveen Singh, uh, who is currently uh, associated with the University of Melbourne. Uh, the title of the paper is slightly different from the one which appears in the program, but the content is essentially the same. Now, uh, before I proceed, a couple of uh, quick, uh, because 10 minutes is all that I've been given. I might overshoot it by a few minutes. I'll try to keep it uh, within the limit as much as I can. Uh, but in case uh, there's anybody uh, in the audience who's interested in more details, I should say that a copy of this uh, paper, the paper underlying today's presentation is available as a Monash University discussion paper. That's the full uh, paper. And, uh, uh, and so if anybody is interested, you can either directly go to the Monash University website, economics department, and then download the paper. Or if you drop me an email, I'll be very happy to send it to you. Now, over the last few years, there has been considerable interest in the area of income or expenditure inequality or inequality per se. And a reason for that, amongst others, is the uh, sharp increase in inequality within countries, uh, uh, especially in countries such as the US, India, China. And that has triggered off a lot of interest in the topic of inequality, which is one of the oldest areas of research interests in, uh, in economics. But in the last five, 10 years, there has been a, quite a significant increase in the uh, interest on the subject of inequality. So before I go into the motivation for this paper, uh, I should point out that unlike inequality within countries, and a lot of this interest is on inequality both within country and globally. And it's very important to remember this distinction, which is central to this exercise. When it comes to uh, global inequality, you have to make sure that all the units of measurement, whether it's income or expenditure, are in the same unit of currency, which is where much of the interest of this study of ours comes from. And how do, you, do we do that? Well, as is well known, you shouldn't be using exchange rates, which are misleading indicators of living standards, which is really what we are trying to capture. And I don't have time here to go into the reasons for it, but they are well recognized. So what do we do? Instead, we use what are known as purchasing power parity. And the purchasing power parity has been made possible both because of, largely because of the International Comparison Project, which is based in the World Bank, which periodically updates these PPPs. And we usually use a numeraire, typically the US dollar, for converting the currencies into uh, the US dollar using PPPs. And the PPPs that are normally used are those that come out of the International Comparison Program, which are referred to as ICP in short. So please keep this in mind as we go along. That's what. So one of the questions we try to answer in this uh, mind you, keep in mind that when it comes to within country inequality, you don't need to worry about a currency conversion because within country, the inequalities, uh, the, expense, the units don't have to be converted into US dollars, but it's only when you're looking at comparison between countries uh, or typically global comparison where the whole world is made up of as if it's a single country. So one of the questions we ask in this is how sensitive are these inequality estimates 
typically global inequality estimates or even regional inequality estimates, because region can involve countries with various currencies to the PPP that is used. And typically it's the ICP PPPs that have been used. So one of the departures of the study is to look at besides ICP PPPs, other PPPs. And that is one of the prime objectives of the study. How sensitive are the inequality estimates to the PPP that you use? Apart from that, we look at the overall picture with this interest on sensitivity on inequality. And there comes a distinguishing feature of this study. As we shall see in a moment, there has been a lot of studies on inequality, but either they are global, whole world as a whole, with all the PPP conversions that we require, or they are individual country specific, like China, India, some of the smaller European countries, but principally China, India, South Africa. But there does not seem to be, to our knowledge, many examples of inequalities which are regional. And one of the things which will come out is that often the regional picture might be out of sync with the global picture or even with the countries in that region. So that is another distinguishing feature of this study that we look at not just global, which we certainly do, not just as individual, which we also do, especially China, India, and the US, but we look at the regions. And by regions, we typically have in mind the regions mentioned or classified in the World Bank by, uh, and it'll be clear what we mean by regions, but they are groups of countries. So that is, so without further ado, let me now uh, uh, go down uh, the, uh, let me now go on, go down the ladder when it comes to the PowerPoints. Okay. So the motivation is clear in the next slide. So this captures what I just said is, and I won't read it out, but uh, uh, the first dot points are pretty clear. The other picture, which I won't go into this in this particular talk, but is available in the uh, discussion paper version, which I signal, is another type of sensitivity, which is between fixed rate PPPs. In other words, once you fix the PPPs, it is typically the case that you backcast it to all the periods, years, but hold them fixed. So you don't move them between years. Whereas Martin Revelion in 2013 provided reasonably convincing evidence that the PPPs will be changing by the year. And uh, what we try to do, which is in the full version, but I won't have time to get into here, is that the picture can change a lot if you move between fixed PPPs, by fixed I mean fixed for the whole period, which is 95 to 2011, let me look here, or if you allow the PPPs to vary by each of the four years. And the overall uh, evidence I want to leave you with that on that is that the picture of decreasing inequality over parts of the period seems to be restricted to fixed PPPs. Once you bring in varying PPPs, the inequality increases a lot. So that is something which I won't go into this here, but if anybody's interested, you're most welcome to either write to one of us or just download it from the Monash University. I think it came out last year. Okay, so, and also, as I'll try to go through it in a moment, we also go into the composition, <coughs> the regional composition, and also how the global income shares of the median households. So what do I mean by that? Uh, say 25th, if there are something like uh, uh, eight or 10 regions, 
So there'll be eight or 10 median income levels. So how do the medium income share of each of these regions as the share of the sum of the medium incomes, how has that behaved? So this is basically what uh, uh, drives the motivation. Now let's quickly go on to the literature review. And as I said, the studies generally fall in between the top, which is global, or in the one below, which is on individual countries. Of course, on the global inequality, much of the resurgence of interest has been due to the studies by the Alberto et al. a few years back, but that is global, although it does have individual countries as well. But the ones I have in mind when it comes to individual country studies are Chancel and Piketty, uh, which has just come out in the Review of Income and Wealth, and Himangshu on India is widely cited. And then, of course, there is a study by Piketty, Yang, and Zuckman on China. But the point I should make is that these are all individual country. And what our study tries to do is to chalk out a middle, in a, a middle road, middle of the, uh, between the two. And now, when it comes to the PPPs, I did say that the main uh, PPPs that has been used in the literature is the IC PPPs. But we try to also, which we do as well here as a benchmark, but there are alternative sets of PPPs which we describe in the paper. So, uh, and they are partly, uh, uh, Hill proposed what is known as the EGWK and so on and so forth. So, so this is basically the uh, literature review. Let's now go to the methodology. So the top half just lists out the various PPPs that we used. As I said, the ICP is the main one. That is the benchmark. That is the one most widely used. Then we have the GEX index, the Geary Commerce index, the EGWK is due to Hill. And of course, there is the CPD approach, uh, which uh, 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 has got a pretty long history as well. And by the way, I should point out that the ICP is also based on a mixture of these. So I don't have time to go into these, but they are well described in the discussion paper version. Now, now moving to inequality, it is very important to distinguish between inequality between countries and inequality within countries. And this is a distinction which we use following Milanovic. So concept one, so use uh, three concepts. There's a fourth concept, uh, which we also use, but I won't go into it, but because of time shortage, which is called concept four, uh, which is more on intra-country inequality. But in this talk, I'm going to fix, concentrate on concept one, concept two, and concept three inequality. So as I said, concept one means inequality between the per capita incomes of the countries. If there are hundred countries, You've got 100 per capita income with currency converted at PPP, what is the inequality? And concept two is also inequality between countries, but the slight tweak of this to distinguish between concept one is that the per capita incomes are now weighted by its population share. So typically China and India gets a greater weight. So in principle and spirit, it's, inter it's the same as concept one, but as we'll see in a moment, it makes a big difference. That's another sensitivity which comes to the fore. Uh, uh, that once you share it by the population, so countries like Indonesia, China, India get a greater share in concept two, there is a reasonable change in the picture on inequality. And finally, concept three is where you put all the countries into a global pool and the, needless to say, you have to use PPPs. And then you ask the question, what is the inequality of this huge country called the world? And that is called concept three inequality. Okay, so that is uh, where we are coming from. Now the data sources, a significant part of 
the work went in assembling the data sets. And because of the need to have data, maintain consistency, which we can't be 100% sure we have been able to compare all, but we have tried our best, is over the period 1995 to 2011. So I think we did 95, 2000, 2005, and 2011. This was a very significant period because this was a period where the world went through several political come economic events, like the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and so on, the Eurozone debt crisis. So this was a very significant period and that covered the whole period and there were four specific benchmark years where we looked at it. And as I said, the ICP PPPs were taken directly from the ICPs, which are periodically done every four or five years. It's a massive exercise done by the World Bank through the ICP. Whereas the non-ICPs, and by that I mean GEX, etc., cetera, uh, CPD, we took it, we, have, we calculated uh, in a separate study, which I did with two other quarters, and that's available in 2017 and it is referred to in the discussion paper version. And the rest are pretty straightforward. And this data set, as I said, for a variety of data sources, LIS, Living Standard, LSMS, POFCAL, World Bank website. And it covers nearly 85% of the world's population. So I won't claim this to be the whole world, but I think it's, you know, I'm sure people will agree it is a large, part of the world. The other thing I should mention before I proceed to the results is that this is inequality done in terms of income, not consumption, and we draw a distinction between the two, which means that for countries where income figures were not available, and please keep in mind that builds in errors and biases, we can, and these are typically uh, emerging countries where it's easier to get consumption and income, we converted them into income figures using uh, the consumption income ratio, which I should put my cards on the stable, can build in some biases. So please grip this at the top back of your mind. Now, since time is moving on, let's now move on to uh, the tables. So this is the global per capita median income of each region, and that tells you the regions we are looking at. And these are the World Bank regions, defined regions, uh, typically Africa, Asia Pacific, CIS are the Confederation of Independent States. As you know, uh, in the 1990s, uh, the Soviet Union gave rise and the other East European countries with the collapse of uh, communism uh, gave rise to the CIS. So I would take 95 to be the start of the CIS, which is also our starting year. And 2011 is obviously the terminal year. And one thing we can see, if I can make a few comments uh, on this, that uh, the, the income, uh, the region I want to, uh, Eurostat, OECD has had an impressive increase. And so has the Asia Pacific. But the one which I find to be at the top of the list is the CES, CIS, that has, remember CIS was well below uh, Eurostat, but by the end of the period, it has nearly uh, gone up by well over 40%. But overall, the picture was one of steady income increase at a median income level for each region. Now, as I said, and I wouldn't have time to stress this enough, but it's in the paper, when you look from left to right on the, on the uh, you will see how sensitive these are to the PPPs. So the first column of numbers is the benchmark PPP, which is ICP. And then when you go to columns two, three, four, five, uh, you can see that uh, it, it is fairly sensitive. However, however, the trend is fairly robust. The trend is fairly robust. But the point I want to make is that the ICP PPPs, which is the one we usually run with, uh, there uh, are, can change the inequality based uh, the measures 
once you move to from left to right. So that is a pretty important point. For example, GEX seems to be, but and even GK seems to be, uh, I would say GEX and EW, uh, the, that's the extended uh, weighted GK are particularly out of sync with ICP. But I should also stress that the trend is fairly robust. Okay, let's move on. Now look at, look at the income share. Again, it's the per capita income, median income share. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six regions. So each region has got a median income at PPPs. And you ask the question, what is the share of that median income household over the six regions? That's the way to interpret the figure. So let's quickly, now for the sake of clarity, uh, we have just presented the figure for 95 and 2011. And you can see, uh, again, the trend is robust, but the magnitudes are not between PPPs. But you can say some uh, about general conclusions, namely that Africa has had a decline, but the one which comes out is the CIS again, from 12 to 13% in 1995 at ICPB, it goes up to 15%, which is quite a significant jump. The developed world, which is the Eurostat OECD, which is not surprisingly has got nearly half the overall share of the media, the median income uh, has been fairly steady. Uh, Latin America has also gone up in terms of median income share, and that picture is fairly robust between the PPPs. Let's move on. Now, there has been a lot of interest in China and India because this was the, the period where not only were the emerging economies and they have become emerged economies, certainly China, uh, but uh, uh, this was also the period where they had significant income increase. So that speaks for itself. Now, there is an interesting difference between China and India. China experience is much median income, mind you, the median income household has been much, much more impressive than India's. India has gone up from $78. Uh, this is per capita median income. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, to 102, whereas it's almost doubled in the case of China. So that is comes through when we look at the share. So the the one before is the China India bilateral comparison. The second one is the share of the world income. So again, China has increased its share again at the median income level from seven to nearly 9%. Whereas for India, not only has it not gone up, but it's actually slipped from 5.3% to 4.2% at ICP PPPs. And you can see how sensitive, I don't want to exaggerate it, but it's moderately sensitive. For example, if you take GK, and ICP for China in 95, ICP overstates the share of income of China, 7%, whereas uh, uh, IGK is 5.8%. So it's fairly sensitive in absolute shares, but the overall trend, particularly the China-India comparison is fairly robust. Okay. Now let's look at within country. Uh, within region, within region, where each region, this is more in the spirit of concept three. So you can see that, and this is the bottom 50%. Now you can see that in Africa, and again, I'll just focus on ICP, but I leave you to look at the rest when you have the time and certainly it's spelled out in greater detail in the discussion paper. So in Africa, the bottom 50% of the households command, and keep in mind that we have access to the data at the household level with all its qualifications. So 50% of the households at uh, uh, bottom 50% command less than 10% in Africa. 
whereas in West Asia, it's much more, 28%. So these are two extremes. And if you look at uh, Asia Pacific, 18%, Eurostat is 15%. So these are, this should give you uh, uh, some idea. But if you compare the top half with the bottom half, one encouraging thing is that overall, the bottom 50% share has been going up. And Africa has done the best. It's doubled from 9% to 17%. But generally, it has gone up. But again, the most impressive has been the performance of CIS from 7.6% to nearly 29%. The other thing which so the trend is fairly sensitive to which region you're looking at. The other thing which comes out is that if you leave out West Asia, which is a small region, so I won't place too much focus on it, the Eurostat region is probably got one of the highest shares uh, of the bottom 50%. And even there, through the period, 95 to 2011, the bottom 50% share has gone up most in Eurostat. It was already high, but at 22%, it's second, uh, if you leave out West Asia, only to the CIS. So CIS and Eurostat, as we move on, uh, can uh, I can point to as the two regions where the income share of the bottom 50% has gone up a lot. But overall, the movement has been in a progressive direction for all the regions. Now let's look at the other extreme, 10%, top 10%. So here again, it's in the downward direction. It's been generally going down and that has been fairly steady. So Eurostat, OECD, again, consistent with what I said earlier, uh, the top 10% went down quite sharply, again, consistent with what I said earlier. For the uh, CIS, the top 10% went down fairly largely, quite significantly. So the, prog the progressive movement away from the top 10% to the 50% has generally held right across but it seems to be particularly pronounced in the case of CIS and the uh, Eurostat OECD region. Okay, now we turn to the actual inequality estimates. And please keep in mind the distinction between concept one and concept two and concept three. Concept one and two, if you need reminding our inequality between countries, one being weighted by population share, which is concept two, whereas concept three is genuine intra-country, intra-world inequality. Now, what do we find? One thing we find, and this is based only on Gini, but in the paper, we also report the tile shorox coefficient estimates. So by and large, between countries at the per capita income level, unweighted between countries, uh, the inequality has been fairly static. Doesn't change much, a little bit based on Gini. But Note something very interesting. Once you move away from concept one inequality, which to repeat is between countries, between the per capita income, what do we find once you move on to weight? What we find is that there has been a sharp, especially in the 90s, reduction in concept two inequality. Now what's going on here? Why has the concept two inequality recorded such a large decline? And the reason has to do with the fact that many of the emerging economies, especially India, China, and Indonesia, to a lesser extent, Brazil, have, had, have been moving closer towards the OECD countries. So they are not only emerging, but emerging in a big way. And because their population share weighted, concept two, that is showing that inequality between countries is recording a larger fall when you use concept two. So that is coming through. And this is particularly the case between 95 and 2000, which was the period. Things have stalled a bit, not much, it's still carrying on uh, in the 2000s because of GFC, which has hit. There's another factor which you must keep in mind that the GFC didn't hit China and India as much as it did the Western, the OECD countries. And that is also one reason why we basically see the 
discord between the concept one and concept two. But the main takeaway from this is that inequality between countries has either remained largely static, not has gone, not gone up, or has in fact fallen sharply, mainly on the back of the rise of some of the larger populous developing countries. Okay, what about concept three? Concept three is, is interesting because this is the world inequality. And the picture here is again, somewhat different. And I'm again focusing on ICP. The trend is fairly robust between PPPs. And the, why do I say it's slightly different? Because the world inequality, which is unlike inter-country inequality, has the whole world, has intra-country inequality, is larger. So the main takeaway is that while countries have been moving towards each other, especially the developing countries, the emerging countries, and that is leading to a fall in uh, the uh, inter-country inequalities, especially concept two inequality, inter-country. But intra-country inequality, so citizens within the country have been moving away. Good example is again China and India, South Africa. And that means that when you put them into a whole global pool, you don't see that decline. And in fact, the magnitudes, compare concept two and concept three. That's what I would like you to do. And you can see that the concept three inequalities are much, much larger. So people are pulled, moving away from each other, certainly in India, for example, which I know a bit more uh, uh, in, in intra-country inequality. And China is another example which comes to mind. While China and India move closer to the OECD based on uh, the per capita, this is another warning limitation of using summary figures. Uh, countries within China and India, citizens within China and India have been moving up. So inequality has been going up. Okay. What's happening by region? I won't spend too much time because I'm already beginning to cross the limit allot allotted to me, but I'll leave you to look at these pictures later. The other thing, we, and these are between regions. So when I say Africa, it is between countries in Africa. Asia Pacific is in between countries in Asia Pacific. One thing which comes out is that at the regional level, and again, it's concept one and concept two, Asia Pacific region has got because the highest inter-country inequality. And that is because it is the most heterogeneous region. So while China and India have been moving ahead, that's not true of many of these other smaller countries in the Asia Pacific region. In contrast, comparatively, the CIS, uh, inter-country inequality, the CIS region is much less because it's relatively more homogeneous. So it's true of Eurostat, as you would expect, because they're all developed countries. But Asia Pacific stands out as one region where the inter-country inequality is pretty high. And it's pretty much the same story against Again, concept two, uh, Asia Pacific stands out, but here the inequality between countries in the Asia Pacific region goes up because within Asia Pacific is the more populous part of Asia Pacific that has moved away from the rest within Asia Pacific. Okay, so, and then from, and this gives all the four benchmark years. Okay. Now we go back to concept three inequality, which is intra-country by region. And again, one thing which comes out is on the positive side, Europe stands out as being on intra-country or intra-region inequality as being a low income, uh, low inequality region. And that's a lot largely because of a tradition of social welfare policies progressive taxation, Europe, especially Scandinavia, as we all know, or France, where there is a tradition of progressive policies. So intra-regional inequality, which is more concept three applied to the region, Europe comes out as a low inequality region, not surprisingly because of social welfare policies. Let's move on. And that gives you all the four benchmark years. The other thing which comes out is that Asia Pacific doesn't do very well when it comes to intra-region inequality. It goes up from uh, point, 
uh, 6.4 to 0.86. So when, so remember that Asia Pacific has on one hand a poor Nepalese and a rich Chinese, a lot of heterogeneity and that's showing up in the large inequality between the citizens of the Asia Pacific region. Okay, and this is just zeroing in on China, India, and you can see that US, something which we know, uh, is one of the most unequal countries in the world. So this is at the country level. As I said, it's a mix. This study is a mix of region, uh, of global region and country. Uh, but China and India are not that far behind. A Gini of 0.3 plus is pretty high. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the study of uh, PKT et al shows that China and India's top 1% is share is amongst the highest in the world. So, uh, and so is the US. So is US is, comes out in this three comparison countries, three way comparison to be one of the most unequal countries in the world. Uh, although it hasn't changed much, but China and India are not far behind. Okay, let's move on. Now, um, all that it does is presented pictorially, the rest, and you can see how they're moving on. And if you can see, if I can just go back to the top picture, which is at the 25th percentile income, the share is going up generally with a couple of small exceptions. Uh, by and large, one is Asia Pacific, which is consistent with, I said earlier, has by and large been going up, uh, especially uh, the, uh, the Eurostat OECD, which is the top half, the very top one. Okay, and this is the 50th, this is the 75th, and this is the top percentile. And when it comes to the top percentile, the Eurostat region, the top, the 100th percentile, has had the largest income increase in the period, not throughout the period, but 2005 to 2011. So this is the top uh, period. So the overall picture from these pictures is that again, there is a lot of regional heterogeneity. So, uh, uh, global aggregation can hide this regional heterogeneity under the carpet, so it can give a misleading picture. So that brings me to a summary of the principal points. And again, I would really urge you to get hold of the discussion paper, which goes into it in great detail. And now this period, as I've already stressed, covered a period which saw political and economic developments on a scale rarely seen before, both pluses and minuses, huge increase throughout, but it also coincides with some of the greatest crises, like the GFC, uh, for example, and the Eurozone crisis, and so on and so forth. But this is also the period where there has been a lot of international economic integration and globalization over the short period. And thanks to that, uh, the, uh, the emerging economies have pulled closer to the developing countries, which is where the concept to inequality decrease can be explained. Please keep that in mind. So the third is what I've just said. The fourth, the global picture does not hold for all the regions. This is a very important point. This message comes up from this, that, and that sets up the uh, rationale for looking at the regions, which holds in between individual country and the global picture. And last but not least, considerable sensitivity of these between uh, to the PPPs, it, especially between the ICP and the four non-ICPs, but only in magnitude. Reassuringly, the trend is fairly robust. Uh, the sharp differences we have looked at the 50%. And uh, so overall message is the third dot point that global inequality estimates can give a misleading picture of the inequality, both in individual countries and in the various geographical regions. And the China-India comparison, which is worth uh, pointing out again, signaling is that China's share at the median income has gone up. Uh, whereas yeah, uh, uh, India's has not hugely, but 
a fairly significant decline from 5.4 to 4.33 percent. Part of it could be is attributed to the rise of China, because remember, China then becomes a part of the rest of the world. And that really brings me to the uh, to the uh, to the end of the slides. And what I would do is to now close it off. And let's see uh, uh, how I can do that. And but that basically uh, finishes off uh, these. Right. Okay. And